Well, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers, but I think they probably made a mistake by having me speak, so I'll do that. Um, thanks, everybody. I'd uh, like to have this provocative title called Manos, uh, Healer and Destroyer. And uh, the bottom line is just really going to be some of the things you've already heard, that they are good effects, they are bad effects. And uh, before setting up this title, I didn't know how many other studies would uh, sort of come to the same conclusion. But in any event, um, <clears throat> give you a little bit of, of history of how some of this thing happened. And it's going to be examples of a variety of studies we've done over the years and sort of compiling those uh, together in something that I hope eventually makes sense. So you've seen uh, a picture of Max before. This was the uh, the boy who had uh, hepatic fibrosis and protein losing enteropathy, hypoglycemia coagulopathy. So we had a number of different things. He was uh, actually in danger of, of dying. But uh, it turned out, uh, of course, with all those things, that was a very bad situation. But the good part was that his disorder was actually treatable with fairly modest amounts of, of mannose supplements, about a gram per kilogram per day. So. Uh, that's good. That's certainly a good uh, outcome for him. And here's what the uh, data actually looked like. So before uh, Manos, which is on the, on the left side, you can see that his antithrombin-3, which is a coagulation protein, is below the dashed purple line, which is the uh, uh, normal level. And then after Manos and continuing on Manos therapy, he goes up above normal uh, albumin. He was always low there, had to have periodic infusions of albumin to keep it, uh, the level up. After Manos, bang, he's back in the normal range. Uh, fecal alpha-1 antitrypsin in the lower part of the panel uh, is a measure of protein-losing enteropathy. And you can see that on the left side, he's very much above normal, put him on Manos, and things get much better for him. So um, clearly, that was a, a very good outcome. This, he was not the only patient. For instance, here was another one, uh, Brianna, when she was about six months old, and she had a plasma glucose level of 26 the first time it was measured. I mean, really seriously low. Normal is about 100. And she was less than 10% of normal height. And uh, put her own man manos and plasma glucose uh, normalized, and she did a, a growth spurt and caught up completely. So she was in the middle of the of the growth curve. And this is a picture of uh, Brianna about a year ago. She's a happy girl. Well, we've had probably a number of other patients treated with manos. I think probably uh, 20 or 30 have been treated with manos at this point. And so what's what's going on? Well, it turns out that this. Um, and I wonder if we have another pointer, because this one is, is losing its uh, Zumba here. You got one? All right, thanks. Thanks, Jerry. There we go. Um, so, Manos, what's, what's going on? Well, here's the way Manos is metabolized. It can come in, be converted to Manose 6-phosphate, Manose 1-phosphate. That goes on to make glycoproteins. Uh, you'll notice that you can also make uh, Manose 6-phosphate from glucose. And what happens is that patients with a mutation in this gene, an MPI, phosphomannose isomerase, are the ones that can be treated uh, with uh, mannose and rather successfully. So therefore, obviously, mannose is a very good sugar. How does that work? Well, it turns out that it works because that's where the, the deficiency is, as you can see right there. Okay, and so that is a hypomorphic mutation in these patients. And fortunately, there's a transporter that will carry mannose from the outside of the cell to the inside. And now you just bypass that block in the pathway and uh, reestablish a normal amount of glycosylation. So again, that's uh, good. Only about 5%, uh, uh, 2 to 5% of the mannose is actually gone into this pathway. The great majority is actually degraded in glycolysis by going back in, in this direction. So it's, it's fuel. It's just burned like normal fuel. So we decided that we would um, uh, make a knockout mouse. And the knockout mouse uh, should now replicate all the things that we had seen in patients. That made great sense to us. And so we were a bit shocked when the mouse died. 
in utero at about ten and a half days. And we said, oh, that, that didn't work. How, you know what we need to do? <laughs> we need to get mannose, right? You just add mannose, have mom drink some mannose. There's not enough mannose, and that will take care of things, right? Well, we did that, and guess what happened? The mice died earlier. It was even more toxic. What was going on? Well, it turns out that that is a knockout. It's not a hypomorphic allele. It's a knockout. So mannose 6-phosphate has no escape route once it comes into the cell. So it builds up inside the cell, and ATP is depleted. And the reason is because glycolysis is inhibited when you get to very high concentrations of mannose 6-phosphate. So it has now become a toxin mannose. Very, very bad sugar. Not what you want. Well, let's go ahead and now let's make a hypomorphic mouse. Okay, one that has patient mutations that has about 15% residual activity the way we would expect to see it in a patient. And so now what happens to, to these mice? Well, we found that ICAM-1 uh, is a sensitive marker of glycosylation. And that is involved in the extravasation of neutrophils from the circulation into the tissue. So what we would do is an inflammation, uh, a peritoneal inflammation with zymosan, and then see if these neutrophils could uh, actually migrate into the uh, peritoneum. And that is dependent, we know, on an active ICAM molecule being there. And so what you could see is that, in fact, the neutrophils could normally, under inflammation conditions, move into uh, the peritoneum. That was great. But they were much, much less in this knock-in, KI. We, that's what we use for knock-in. And in fact, it was no better than the complete ICAM-1 knockout. If you look at ICAM-1 in terms of PBS and a wild type, uh, there is not very much induced. Here there's a big induction with zymosan, and there's a, a, a very large amount of increase. Here's the MPI knockout, and we, we do the same thing here, and you don't see induction. You see the loss of it. And, in fact, again, it was comparable to what we had seen in uh, an ICAM knockout mouse. If you now go up uh, close by and look at the possibility of rescuing this with mannose. So this is a phenotype that maybe could be rescued. Here is wild type uh, just on water. And you can see that there is a big induction. However, the MPI uh, knock-in gives very little. However, you put this on 5% mannose. And this is an adult mouse. And now you can restore a large amount of the um, expression of ICAM-1, and in fact, the neutrophils can now come much closer to normal into migrating into the peritoneum. So we've created a, a model that fortunately has some beneficial effects. The problem was that this was the only thing that appeared to be wrong with the mouse. We thought it was going to be a great model for patients that we would see reflected this hypoglycosylation, uh, all these other problems, but we will have solved the uh, problem of death. Uh, at least from that standpoint, mannose was a good sugar, but then we found out that there wasn't any other phenotype. And we worked on it a couple of years to try to pull out of these things, and we could find nothing. So that was good, but that was made it a rather limited study. But one of the things we found was that there was a deficiency in the number of expected uh, knock-in mice that we would generate from heterozygous breeding. And so we thought, well, what we need to do, same thing, right, is now feed mannose. And if we feed mannose to mom, that will correct that slight uh, embryonic lethality and we'll be back to normal. Again, we get a surprise. What's the surprise? Well, it turns out that... Um, Manos is actually lethal to these hypomorphic pups when the dams are given 5% mannose. And you can see that we've done a, uh, 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 an ultrasound to, to look at the number of embryos, and you can see that by 10 and a half to 12 and a half days, all the embryos are, are dying. And so we were never able to get any viable ones. And so what's going on here? 
Manos is now a very bad sugar again. What's going on? What? What was that? Did you hear what he said? Did you hear that? All right. This guy doesn't know how to talk loud enough. He's had no experience. He's saying mannose 6-phosphate. That's what the problem is. So mannose 6-phosphate was depleted before, and now maybe we get too much. And, in fact, that's exactly what happens both in the embryos and in the placenta. And so you can see here that if we look at wild-type um, mice, the embryos, they have very, very low levels. You can increase it some with 2% mannose, but look what happens when you go into 2% mannose now in these embryos. You can, you can see that there is an increase. You look at the same thing in the placenta and you see exactly the same thing. There is an increase of mannose 6-phosphate within the embryos and the placenta. So, oh, what's wrong with those guys? Uh-oh. This is, these are the survivors. 50% of the survivors, the ones that lived, now were born blind. They either had these things that look like cataracts over here, or they were born without an eye. And this is just from having a, a, a survivable amount of mannose given to them, given to their moms. What's going on? Well, it turns out that mannose 6-phosphate, again, is accumulating in those eyes that you saw on the left side. In fact, if we look at those cloudy eyes, you can see that the amount of mannose 6-phosphate here is increased, and that's quite significant above what you'd have in wild type. If there is a non-cloudy eye, in other words, one that hasn't uh, sort of developed that, we could see that there was still an, an increase above the, the wild type, and, but it was not quite as high as that. So there was not only mannose 6-phosphate that increased, there was also free mannose in the eye. And the amount of mannitol, which would be a product that might be expected to produce some of the clouding in the cornea, uh, didn't occur. Uh, and that you would take from galactosemia patients who oftentimes accumulate galactitol in their eyes causing to cataracts. So this was a, a, a bad situation for these mice. So why did it happen? Well, if you look at normal eye development, um, starting at about E10 and a half, there is the formation of the lens placode. This is the optic uh, vesicle here. Here is the neural uh, uh, ectoderm that's forming. And as you go along, you can see there is the formation of, of a lens here, here, and here. Okay, this is progressing down to E16.5. So it turns out that for these, and I'm not going to go through every panel, but the point is that here is, again, sort of a recapitulation of the normal wild type. Here is the knock-ins in, in the affected lens, and here's in animals that have no lens at all. And what you can see is that in contrast to the formation of a normal lens here, the lens never forms. And because the lens never forms and it's involved in the signaling to all of the other tissues for regulation of development and differentiation of the cells, that never happens. So there's basically a hole in the eye that's created from this. Manos, very, very bad sugar. Well, how bad is bad? Can we measure it? Can we get some, some sort of a feeling of, uh, instead of just uh, saying, well, there's a little bit too much of mannose 6-phosphate, not enough over here. Can we get some quantitative measure of how that, that can actually occur? And Mia Ishikawa uh, developed a wonderful technique. And so here is a recapitulation of that pathway again. And remember, there's transporters that can bring in glucose and mannose. What she was able to do was to differentially label mannose and glucose with heavy isotopes. And then by uh, GCMS, 
she could analyze those, the proportions of each of those that were incorporated into n glycans by hydrolyzing, by releasing those, hydrolyzing, and then measuring it on GCMS. And, um, you know, as Jerry pointed out a little bit earlier, everybody runs their experiments in 25, 30 millimolar glucose. Uh, bad news. Bad news. We always did it in physiological conditions. And it turns out that there's 50 micromolar mannose, 5 millimolar mannose. That's, that's the way we have circulation. So if we looked at your mannose, that would be your level. So we were able to uh, use this to actually determine how much was contributed by this pathway. In other words, how much came from glucose, how much came from mannose. And it was really quite interesting. So if you look at a number of different cell lines here, we can now quantify by GCMS the amount contributed by mannose and by glucose, and we can see how much of each of these was taken up. And the, the bottom line, and the point I want to make, is remember I said only 2% of the glucose, or mannose, is actually used for glycosylation. You say, well, that's hardly anything. Right, but it is much higher than what comes from glucose, where only 0.01% to 0.03% comes from glucose. So it's a matter of now selective, in some sense, utilization, because remember, mannose is 100 times less uh, concentration in the plasma, and yet you can have uh, up to 50% of the mannose for glycoproteins coming from mannose directly. And this is just a series of, as we increase in different cell lines, the amount of uh, mannose in the medium. And what you can see is that you can get up to almost 80, 90% in some tissues, some cell lines of mannose directly coming from mannose. So we have a sensitive way of analyzing the contributions of each one. So, uh, that, that was it, and now I want to switch gears a little bit to talk about a type of CDG, a congenital disorder of glycosylation, that we've worked on recently. And if you go back to the literature about five or six years ago, this uh, disorder only had uh, half a dozen patients or so listed. Now, because of some studies in just a few families where they had multiple kids, there are 17 patients. Well, now because of whole exome sequencing and uh, you know, hard work by Bobby Ng in the lab, uh, we have now found uh, about uh, 34 newly diagnosed patients. We're writing up a clinical report on that. There are 23 new mutations, and of course this involved a lot of collaborators from around the country and internationally, I should add. So let me just go through what this looks like in terms of the uh, point of lesion. That's right here. This is an acetyl glucosamine being added to lipid linked oligosaccharide to, to form it. And now here's the first mannose. And then here are subsequent genes that are involved in the addition of other mannose residues. So this is the first one. Okay. We use transferrin as a model glycoprotein to inform us about the glycosylation status of patients' generalized glycoproteins. Transferrin is an uh, iron-carrying protein in the, in the serum. So when it's normally glycosylated, it has these two sugar chains, and that is this peak. If there is the absence of an entire chain of carbohydrates, it's really good because now you see that peak. If there's an absence of two chains, you get that peak. And if there are individual sugars missing, you could actually see little peaks in between there. So we have a sensitive way of saying this uh, patient probably has a glycosylation disorder. This is something you need to look at now genetically to actually determine what it is. And so in these patients, uh, people had seen early on that there was this kind of a pattern saying you didn't have enough of the right mature glycan to make these sorts of uh, uh, glycosylation. So here is one of the uh, ALG1 patients that we saw, and uh, that makes sense. It's a pretty smooth curve. The expected ones are there, but oh my, look at those little guys. What were they all about? 
Well, if you do the mass analysis, because this is very specific for the actual mass of the oligosaccharide, the only thing that comes out to match this would be one full chain and some weird thing here, and only one weird thing here, but no other full chain. Well, you know, can we take this seriously? And if so, how could you, how could you do that? Well, it turns out that actually ALG1 mutations generate what I call a xenobiotic glycan. Okay, this is something that doesn't normally exist in nature. So here's a normal pathway, okay? Here is an ALG1 patient who will make this little truncated oligosaccharide. That can be flipped into the lumen of the ER, and it can be transferred to protein. Once it's transferred to protein, what does it do? It goes to the Golgi. And now the Golgi says, well, I know what to do with you kind of guys. I've seen your type before. And what we're going to do is we're going to just add galactose and sialic acid to that. That's totally atypical. Right? You never have this, this kind of a glycan running around. But you do have the transferases. You do have proteins that contain this. Now, that would be a way of explaining how this thing actually came about. And so uh, Miao He at uh, CHOP in uh, Children's Hospital Philadelphia actually was the first to detect this glycan and did it on a number of patients that we uh, sent to her and a couple that she was finding on her own and then later found out were ALG1. So you could see that this peak was there in oligosaccharides that had been released from glycoproteins in the serum. And if you look at CDG1K, which is another name for ALG1, you could see that there was a large amount of this material relative to control and CDG1A, which is another uh, type that I'll talk about in just a second, that also had a little bit, but not nearly as much. Well, guess what? We had one patient who we put on mannose, one ALG1 patient. And when you look at the amount of that funny peak uh, without mannose, it's here, put them on mannose, and it's here. It decreases it. It didn't decrease the amount of abnormal transferrin, but it did decrease the amount of this, this abnormal xenobiotic glycan. The patient appears to have done better on mannose, but I think N equals one, hard to really tell. But the reason that that may be important is that because we now have many other patients and we're going to try to check out what mutations might be able to respond to those uh, kind of uh, infusion, well, diet uh, in, in dietary supplements. So again, mannose is now a good sugar. Um, we're going to finally go to something that is body weights, and I'm not talking about either Jamie or Vandana's uh, body weight. We're, uh, we're going to talk about uh, body weights of some mice. And we were looking for ways that we could stress mice of the um, phosphomannose isomerase deficient phenotype. Uh, so we thought, what could be a stress? Well, we could put them on a high-fat diet. What would happen there? Well, I don't know. Let's see. We had some interesting results. We ran control mice as a control, in other words, non-mutated mice. And here's what we found, that if you included mannose in their diet, a high-fat diet, they actually did not gain weight as they would normally on a high-fat diet. So mannose in some way had some protective effect against gaining weight. Was it specific? Well, we tried galactose as uh, another sugar given the same way, and of course now that doesn't have the effect. So it was mannose specific. And if you measure the total amount of fat, the grams of fat per gram of mouse weight, what you can see is, as you would expect, the, the ones on high-fat diet had a lot uh, greater fat, but you put them on mannose and they had much less fat. Uh, we looked in the liver, became very fatty liver on a high-fat diet. Include mannose with it, not the case. It was almost looked like a control without a, a high-fat diet. Mannose, good sugar, right, good sugar. Um, now let's go to a, to a different one, 60% high-fat diet that we gave them at weaning. Uh, 
Okay, so this is the way we had normally done these things at weaning and then progressed. And what we saw was that, yes, we could duplicate the same thing as with 45% fat. They were, uh, they were less fat than they would be otherwise. If we started at three weeks post weaning, you could still get some significant decrease, but not quite as much as you would get if you had started it at weaning. So again, here's normal diet high-fat diet plus mannose, and a high-fat diet. So again, still some reduction. How about if we measure fat mass, though? Well, what you can see here is here's the high-fat diet, and here's the number of grams of fat. Here is what you have on mannose. Same thing over here. You can see, again, that the, the effect is less pronounced, but you see there is much less fat here than in a high-fat diet. So there is something that's controlling the accumulation of fat. Uh, do you need to take mannose all the time? Well, apparently you, you do, because if you have them on mannose at this uh, for 16 weeks and now take the mannose away, what happens is they begin to gain weight again because they're still on a high-fat diet. So mannose is a good sugar, but only if you take it every day. What do we know anything about the mechanism? Well, we've done a lot of metabolic studies within the cell, and it didn't have any effect on food or water intake, energy expenditure, activity. It was exactly the same. In fact, the mice on mannose actually got more calories uh, from the mannose and just eat, eating a little bit more. But they were more fit on mannose. They had a higher speed uh, and more endurance on a treadmill, and they, uh, it looked like they had gone to the gym a lot. So again, mannose be a good sugar. It also improves glucose tolerance and insulin sensitivity. So what are we looking at? How, how can we get a handle on this? So we did a lot of different experiments to show that this was true, but we didn't understand something until we analyzed the feces of these mice. And we found that in fact, the feces from the mice have a greater energy content. So they may be eating as much, but it looks as though they're leaving some energy calories in the feces. It wasn't fat, it didn't look like a fatty stool or anything like this, but there was more energy content. And it also increased the amount of butyrate, which is a, a beneficial short-chain fatty acid that many people associate with a leaner phenotype. So what were we able to do? Well, these studies are still in progress, but we've now looked at the effect of mannose on the gut community. So all of these things that you hear uh, Scott Peterson talk about in terms of profiling the kinds of bacteria uh, that are present in the gut. And I won't go into detail, but just to say you can see that on a normal diet, or with or without mannose, there's not a lot of difference. There are some differences in bacterioides, but that's about the only one. Come over to high-fat diet versus high-fat diet with mannose, and you can see quite significant differences where now the pattern begins to look back very much more like a normal diet or normal diet with, uh, with mannose. So we're doing transcriptional analysis to identify the specific pathways that uh, appear to have been affected in, in giving mannose. So we're at early stages of figuring out what that means. And finally, from work that's not ours, uh, it turns out that mannose is also used as a uh, treatment for urinary tract infections. And the reason that's the case is because, in fact, uh, this is the second most common infection in the U.S., 8 million doctor visits a year. So this is a big industry. This is a very important thing, that, and you can buy mannose um, on the Internet. I mean, you can go on and get it from uh, Amazon. You can get mannose a lot of different places. So there are claims, and it says it eliminates E. coli attached to the prostate, completely uh, free of adverse side effects. Well, not if you happen to be a mom uh, who might be carrying, a, or a mouse mom who could have a, a, a little mouse like this. Doesn't cause weight gain. Well, bravo on that. A body doesn't store it, works in 24 to 48 hours. Bacteria don't become resistant. All those things 
are, are variably true, but it turns out this works because mannose is actually able to compete the binding of E. coli onto the epithelium because it's a mannose binding lectin mediated connection. So essentially you eat, you eat mannose, you pee it out, and that is enough mannose to actually give you protection against urinary tract infections and as a treatment. And in fact, uh, the first clinical trials came out a little over a year ago that show that low debt doses of mannose can actually prevent UTI. So mannose again, very good sugar, but I think we have to remember here as I wrap up that it is a healer and a destroyer. It's useful for patients and mice if you have a MPI deficiency. Urinary tract infections, yeah, and obesity treatment, maybe possibly patients with other glycosylation disorders because there was not that just a single one that depended on mannose, the one I showed you, the ALS1, but there are a number of other glycosylation disorders that could potentially benefit from taking mannose, but those, those studies haven't been done. And uh, the damaging effect, of course, uh, is lethal to those pups with MPI deficiency and can cause blindness. So the bottom line of all this is that it's the balance of the substrate and the enzyme and the metabolic flux. Because if you disrupt that flux, as you, I think, have heard about in several talks today, you can then build up things that would be abnormal and could adversely affect uh, the outcome. So mannose intended for UTI treatment, could it be harmful to moms who don't know they might be carrying a phosphomannose isomerase deficient child when they take that? And could it be lethal? Could it cause blindness? We don't know. But I think those are the kinds of cautions that we have to at least be aware of. So these are the people who did all the work. And uh, you ask where they got the money. Well, the money came from various places, such as the Rocket Fund, uh, the NIH, the Bertrand Might Research Fund, um, and uh, the Papa Hood Foundation contributed some in there. And uh, I want to especially uh, note that, that Mia did all of this very nice work on the metabolic labeling for which uh, she was awarded Paper of the Year in the Journal of Biological Chemistry. And uh, that was a, a quite significant achievement. Vandana and Jamie did all of this stuff on the mice. Ping had worked on various projects, including the, some of the metabolic labeling. And Bobby is our, our, our powerhouse for analyzing CDG patients and uh, somehow, by magic, picking a mutation and saying that's the gene that's defective. He's uh, quite good at doing that. So with that, I'll uh, close up. And thank you. Questions? Hey, Hud. You talked a lot about the balance between mannose and glucose as being, you know, the the cause of some of these phenotypes, and particularly in the knockout versus what was it, hypo the hypomorphs, mice. hypomorphs yeah. mice, yes. Uh, you presented a lot of nice data about the levels of mannose that resulted in the bloodstream. Um, do you think something like the ratio of mannose to glucose may be even more informative, especially in light of some of these downstream effects on glucose levels and insulin response even with glycosylation patterns that we heard of? Yeah, you know, I think that um, that ratio could really be important. And we were thinking about this therapeutically. How could you manipulate things? And uh, it's hard to manipulate glucose, right, and still be uh, a happy person. So we decided to, to vary more about the mannose than try to regulate glucose. But what you would think is considering the, the K uptakes of the transporters, different transporters that may provide mannose and glucose to different tissues, that if you had imbalances one way or the other, that would affect. 
In other words, if you had very high glucose, almost no mannose, you would get a different situation than if you had physiological concentration. So we decided not to, to explore that, but I think you're right. That's what's going to, to matter. And now you would get into the kinds of things Jerry talked about in you know, Oglucnec. Uh, great talk. I, I was struck by the fact that the um, effects of mannose are sort of the opposite of what the effects you would expect to see in the setting of like a high fructose diet uh, in terms of um, promotion of diabetes and things like that. Would you care to speculate at all on whether you think that there's a, a, a biochemical interaction between fructose and mannose or whether this might be something related to the microbiota as well? Oh, gosh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, from, from fructose, uh, there, you know, there are transporters that will pull in fructose. We don't know which transporters actually will carry mannose into the cell. So I can imagine, again, given a balance of different transporters that will have different K uptakes for different ones, different specificities, uh, you would get differences there and it would be cell type specific. How that relates to uh, diabetes and the hypoglycemia, I think the hypoglycemia in these patients results from the fact that the, uh, um, I think it's the IGF-1, uh, one, one of the, uh, what is it, acid labile factor is low. And, and it turns out that that's under glycosylated in these patients. And so they have oftentimes a hyperinsulinemic hypoglycemia. And that is probably related to the glycosylation. Uh, how, you know, it relates to fructose. Nobody has done those kinds of studies, but we do know one thing that in fructose 6-phosphate, right? Mannose 6-phosphate going to fructose 6-phosphate. Um, there are two pools of fructose 6-phosphate at least. One that is majorly fed by glucose, and there's another one that comes from mannose to fr or mannose 6-phosphate, fructose 6-phosphate, and then goes back. So it's a, it's a cloistered pool, and that then donates into glycosylation. We don't know a lot about the intermediary metabolism of, of, of those things because, um, you know, I think as, as Mike and Jerry says, most of this stuff hasn't been looked at since uh, the 60s or 70s. Last question. So, um, so for the MPI patients, so why is mannose 6-phosphate not a problem when you treat them with mannose? For those? Yeah, in the adults, why is it you seeing that problem just in development? Uh, in the mice or in the, the, human, the humans in particular? Um, I, I, think, I think we got damn lucky. Honestly, I mean, the dose that we tried was enough that you didn't get um, um, you didn't get diarrhea. That was the actually the, the limiting factor, and it happened to be just enough that he didn't get too much mannose 6-phosphate. Now, there there is a paper out there that shows that I think at one point my suspicion was he stopped taking mannose had a number of problems, came to the emergency room. They knew uh, who this was. They knew he was an MPI patient. And they said, I know what to do. We'll give him mannose. So they threw in a tremendous amount of mannose, you know, IV. And suddenly he goes into a stupor. And he has seizures, you know, like this. He's fallen apart. And they said, oh, my God, we're making too much mannose 6-phosphate in this kid. Let's give him a bolus of glucose. Popped him right out of it. So... So, you know, it's not the kind of experiment you would have set up, but there is that, that kind of balance that needs to be there, and we got lucky, and I think we hit it pretty good the first time, but that's what we know. Okay, thank you, Had, and all the speakers. And, uh,